So I'm going to talk today about um, some work that we've been doing in the context of a consortium called the Monarch Initiative. It's a fairly new consortium um, that's really, uh, it's um, Peter Robinson and myself and Chris Mungle, uh, as well as some other investigators um, around the world. And uh, the idea is to um, have clinical computational science and basic research science kind of leading um, large scale data integration efforts for genotype to phenotype. So. Um, I just did uh, a back of the envelope count the other day, and um, in OMIM right now, we have more than 3,000 Mendelian diseases that don't have a genetic basis. Um, and in ClinVar, we have 66,000 variants with no known pathogenicity assigned to them. And this is, of course, just the things that have been recorded in these repositories. We know there are so very many more. So we know a lot about the genome, but we still don't know very much about what it does. If you look, actually, at, um, do I have a pointer? This thing? Yes. Let's see, does that work? Yeah, okay. So if you look here, um, in this figure, we took um, all the coding genes in the human genome and looked to see how many of them do we have um, causal mutations for a known disease or phenotype. And that number, and this is from um, OMIM plus ClinVar. Um, that number is about 20 percent, um, but if we take the orthologs of every coding gene in the human genome um, and we compare those against the five top most widely used model organisms, so rat, fly, worm, mouse, and zebrafish, to just look at the orthologs of those and look to see if we have any phenotype data that we know is caused by mutations in those genes, we go up to 80 percent coverage. So that's an enormous amount of data that's being not very well leveraged that's hiding there in the model organism databases and in, mostly in the literature. The other thing is, is that if we look across the different organisms, and this is a very complicated figure, but essentially what it shows is over here um, on the left we have uh, different data sources, um, and then we have um, the different, uh, um, I can't see very well here, we have all of our different species. Um, that have been integrated into the system that we've been building. And when we look across the phenotype categories, and this is just a few shown here, so in integument, um, skeletal defects, muscle, we see that we actually learn different phenotypes from different organisms. So in aggregate, we're actually getting much better. Um, and in fact, many of the types of phenotypes that we see are only seen in one organism. So we want to we want to have that really broad coverage. Some organisms are better at looking at certain kinds of phenotypes. We study zebrafish quite extensively for neural crest development, but there's other non-model organisms in there too. So for, like possums are really excellent um, uh, uh, species to study uh, craniofacial uh, development, um, or uh, naked mole rats for um, for cancer. So there's a lot of um, uh, interest now in including phenotypes more st in a more structured way from non-model organisms from which we don't actually have model organism databases. Okay, so um, the problem though is that um, different communities use different vocabularies to describe their phenotypes. So here we have palmo plantar hyperkeratosis is a clinical term that might be described by a patient as having thick hand skin, but the same phenotype seen in a mouse is described as having ulcerated paws. So it's not a string matching problem to try to associate these phenotypes with one another across species. So the challenge then is that every source uses their own vocabulary, and even on the human side, we have very many different vocabularies for describing phenotypes. Um, but similarly, the same is true across um, all of the um, model and non-model sources as well. So how then can we help machines understand what these phenotype terms mean? The computer does not know what palmo plantar hyperkeratosis means. It knows that it's a string of letters. So how do we turn this string of letters that's used by a clinician into something that can be computable um, across all organisms? So the answer is that we have a universal converter box, and I would conjecture that that is a suite of ontologies. I'm not sure if you all have talked about ontologies yet, but that's what I am as an ontologist, so there's going to be some more of that coming. <laughs> so the ontologies can serve as a bridge to help us relate these, these terminologies across, across sources and across species. So here is an example, um, taking that same example. So palmo, palmo plantar hyperkeratosis. Um, can be described logically. So this is now just essentially um, using log logical axioms in um, what I'll show you in a minute as a graph um, to represent, sort of decompose this term into something that we can compute on. And in this case, we would describe that term as having 
an increased keratinization, where the increased term comes from a standardized vocabulary of qualities, and the keratinization term comes from the gene ontology, um, in combination with a representation of the anatomy from the Uberon um, anatomy ontology, the stratum corneum layer of the skin, um, and that it's located in, the, in an autopod. So you can see where I'm going with this, because if I represent that clinical term, palmoplantar hyper, hyperkeratosis, using these terms, I would, I would also use those same terms to decompose the term that was used in the mouse, um, which was ulcerated paws. So because the logic, de logical decomposition of the human um, term actually matches exactly the decomposition of the mouse term, I now know that those two terms are equivalent across species. And that's essentially how we logically walk across species. So the human phenotype ontology, um, which was um, originally developed by Peter, but um, uh, we have uh, quite a large number of people now that have been contributing it to it in many different ways, um, is a graph structure that represents um, a suite of clinical phenotypes, and um, there was a study done a couple years ago um, that showed, because people always ask us, well, why do we need yet another cl clinical vocabulary? We Don't we have enough yet? Um, the answer is that, yes, we do, because one of the things that we don't have in most of the clinical vocabularies is actually a representation of the patient's phenotypes as if we would treat them as a biological subject in the same way that we would treat a model organism. So. We, th we have to think more atomically about the actual phenotypes that we're seeing, not about billing or quality of care, which is what most of the other clinical vocabularies are more designed for, not to say they can't be used for many different other things as well. But they aren't designed to be um, interoperable in the same kind of way that I just described. And in this case, we actually have, um, it's really an awkward location here. Um, we have this uh, term here in the graph, hyposmia. Um, which is defined logically in the way that I showed you earlier in terms of a gene ontology term, sensory um, perception of smell. Um, and here we have um, deeply set eyes, which are a subtype of abnormality of, of globe position, which is a subtype of abnormal eye morphology. Um, and similarly over here we have motor neuron atrophy. And you can kind of get a sense that there's different anatomical systems represented. There's some um, logical hierarchy there. But what's, what's not shown here in this graph is that each one of these terms is logically defined in the same way that I showed in the last slide in terms of these other ontologies on which there exists an enormous amount of data. So over here on the gene ontology side, um, we actually, that term is related to 34,000 different annotations in 22 species. So we know a lot about what causes hyposmia um, based on the underlying logic of the ontology and its relationship to the, the genetic makeup. And the same thing is true for anatomy and for cell types and a variety of other um, chemicals and drugs. So this forms the basis of large-scale data integration. Um, and here is shown um, some of the data sources that we have in Monarch um, are here. Um, the different data types sort of in the generally categorized in the genotype to phenotype um, buckets. Um, we get different d types of data from different sources. Um, and each one of these sources uses a different ontology to um, capture the phenotype data or the gene expression data or the genotype data or the anatomical data, expression data. Um, in some cases there aren't any and we use text mining tools to, and manual curation and combination to apply those um, to facilitate the use of data that may not be computationally tractionable. Um, and then we build what our, uh, we call these bridging ontologies. Um, so I'll start um, over here since it's the easiest to conceive of. So the Uberon anatomy ontology is essentially an Uber anatomy ontology. It um, subsumes all the other anatomy ontologies and represents metazoan anatomy, so across, across all metazoans. And so because of that um, logical infrastructure, and we have about 14,000 terms now in there, um, we can actually walk across um, things as diverse as um, fly to mouse to human uh, anatomically. And we've done the same thing for phenotype data. So we have the human phenotype ontology over here, but there's a variety of other things, the mouse phenotype ontology, um, the vertebrate trait ontology, which is used by the rat database, um, uh, worms, flies, um, and then similarly for diseases, there are very many different disease vocabularies and they all suck for their own special reasons and they're all awesome for their own special reasons. And so we, uh, we really struggle with the disease vocabularies because really a nosology of disease is very task specific anyway. So in our case, we've um, aggregated the, um, some of the rare disease sources and a few other minor resources um, along with MedGen and MeSH. Um, to create our own hierarchy to, to support the algorithmic types of analyses that we want to do. 
Um, finally, I don't have really time to talk about this, but we've also done the same thing for genotype. One of the biggest struggles that we have in integrating these data across all these sources is that every source associates phenotypes with different aspects of the genotype. So one source will say this phenotype is related to an allele, another will say this phenotype is, re is related to a haplotype, another will give you a SNP, and another will give you a full genotype. So how do we actually aggregate these data when the, the meaning of what's actual cause, actually causal is different in those different sources? So this, this is a little um, uber genotype ontology that allows us to propagate phenotypes properly. Okay, so, um, so trying to harmonize all these things. So how does this work when we actually get it put together? So over here we have, um, um, uh, in the middle we have a patient with a set of phenotypes. Hopefully you can see them because I can't. Um, <laughs> uh, so maybe we might have like uh, microcephaly there at the top um, in, that, in that patient and a set of phenotypes which we would call a phenotypic profile or a phenoprint in some cases. And so what, what the goal is then is to see um, what what um, known diseases or what known models have the most closely matching phenotypes? So really, you know, and this just on this side of things, ignoring, um, uh, ignoring what, uh, just looking for things based on orthology or genomic region. This is really just a phenotype similarity matching problem. And um, here in this case, we can see that the microcephaly over here on the top matches um, hypoplasia of the frontal lobes. Um, but similarly, you know, we might not have a match for that. Um, over here on, in the mouse, but there are other terms that match um, from the phenotypic profile to the, ma to the mouse. Um, and so by doing this, we can actually prioritize um, variants that might be known for disease D for patient A, or variants that are known for mouse M for patient A, or it's ortholog in this case. Um, so, so that's the idea behind um, phenotypic matchmaking across species to inform um, diagnostics. The other thing that you win with this is that, as it turns out, there's a person, a clinician over here in this case, that is actually um, phenotyping um, the patient um, or, uh, in some cases, has um, uh, published a paper or otherwise provided data relating to disease D. Um, and on this side, there's a person who phenotyped mouse M and is responsible for a deep understanding of the phenotypic variation found in the types of genes or the types of um, disease models that, that this person might be studying. And so um, by doing this phenotyping, phenotypic matchmaking, we can also matchmake clinicians to basic research scientists because um, in the end, it's not necessarily the person who might study the same gene family that you want to phenotype your potential model organism that might be modeling your rare disease patient, but actually the person who's experienced in the right kinds of phenotype assays, because those things are very specialized. So here's just a quick example of how we've applied this, um, and there's a link to the paper there. Um, we have a tool that uh, Peter alluded to earlier called Examizer. Um, it also now works on whole genome sequence, although we haven't tested on any cohorts yet. Um, and in this paper, we worked with the Undiagnosed Disease Program to apply these phenotype matching similarity algorithms to help prioritize a variant for this family um, in the STEM1 gene. And in this case, there was no known information in any of the public clinical databases, but we had a really nice match from the MGI source. And, and in combination with um, uh, more traditional exome analyses and pathogenicity measures and Mendelian inheritance patterns and frequency filters, um, that combined with this phenotypic similarity in the mouse, we were able to prioritize this, um, this new uh, disease that was caused by a STEM1 mutation. So getting back to the central biology dogma, genes plus environment equals phenotypes. Well, we all know it's not really that simple. It actually looks something more like that, right? So one of the issues that we have in trying to integrate these data is that um, the standards and the ways that we represent genes, environment, and phenotypes are not actually all that great. And in fact, um, we're doing, you know, better um, with genes, but we are not doing very well with environment or phenotypes, and we're certainly only scratching the surface and trying to describe all of the crazy lines that you see there. So the standards for encoding and exchanging data um, computationally must be up to the challenges of representing all of this. So here we are now where we have a variety of formats for exchanging um, sequence data, um, but we really don't have um, a format for exchanging environment or phenotype data. We have um, vocabularies for describing them, and those are standards, but we don't have a standard format for exchange that we can use in any context computationally. And so um, there's a, a kind of broader than the Monarch Initiative and as part of the Global Alliance and a number of other organizations have been working on a new phenotype exchange format. Um, 
is that a timer for me? Five minutes, okay, perfect. So, because here we are at the right time and place for this example, <laughs> um, I'm gonna explain to you what goes into what we like to fondly refer to as a phenopacket. Um, and the reason we call it a phenopacket is sort of a, a fond name for the phenotype exchange format is because it's a packet of phenotype data that I can hand to you or to you or to you, no matter what kind of biologist or clinician you are or what kind of context you might have. So here you can see that um, we have Donald Trump, he's male, um, he really likes the canonical JSON format. Um, he, but his phenotype profile is essentially a very simple um, method of, of displaying that, um, which says that he's used, he, here we've used the HPO, um, and he has small hands, and this was <laughs> described uh, during development, so he's been assigned the onset of congenital onset. This is a traceable author statement. It was actually made by me. Um, and so in this way, it's, it's really simple, but it's just the simplicity of it that makes it useful in all the different contexts that we might see out there. And there are very many different contexts out there. So we want to exchange clinical phenotype data. In that sense, it's not intending to be, you know, it, it's a proxy for clinical data, for, for clinical EHR data or other clinical phenotyping data that you can't share broadly because of privacy constraints. But these are proxies that can be shared broadly and can be, uh, and are, uh, at the end of the day, um, computable in all these different contexts that, that we have these algorithms. But it works for model organisms, it works for disease vectors, it works for crops, biodiversity, domestic animals. Um, and we can use it for personalized medicine, drug discovery, genetic engineering. The, the, the possibilities are endless, similar to, you know, fast A file for sequence data is used in so very many different contexts. It's the same idea. So, um, just a couple of quick more slides. We have um, a model that we've been working on, as I described earlier, for evidence modeling. This is a, um, a collaboration with um, uh, the Bracket Exchange and um, how much time do I have now? I'm good. Three minutes. Okay, great. Um, uh, the Bracket Exchange and also ClinGen is participating in this evidence modeling. And essentially what we're doing is trying to tease apart the claim, so the genotype to phenotype association, um, from the evidence of that claim and the, where it came from. And so using um, BRCA as a first test case, but essentially doing this for all of ClinVar and in collaboration with ClinGen, like I said, trying to, to build a model where we can tease apart the functional evidence where we see such diversity in the pathogenicity calls, um, and then hopefully be able to build something that's a bit more computationally tract tractable so that we can combine evidence when it comes from very many different places, which is our, our big challenge. Um, so the last thing is just, um, Phenotyping isn't free, so how do you know how much phenotyping you need to do? And we, we struggle with this a lot in the undiagnosed disease program uh, where, you know, it could take a, a whole day to do the phenotyping uh, to create, you know, a phenotype profile that's computationally useful. Um, so one of the things I would like to, to, to suggest is that, you know, in fact, what we, what we need to be doing when we're, whenever we're annotating any data, it's not specific to phenotype data, is to be using all the data that we already have out there to help inform better the curation that we're doing in any given context. So for phenotyping, it's, it's like if you go to Amazon and, you know, users who shop for this also like that. Well, there's an army of ontologists behind the scenes that are making those relationships to help you figure that out. So if you, um, and this is from an example from Star Trek that I don't have time to show you, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but the idea is that if you're, you know, if you're looking, um, you know, for very rare phenotype, then it won't take very many descriptions. But if your sets of phenotypes are much more common or only limited to one anatomical system, you're going to need to go a lot deeper. And so we have a tool and some metrics that take advantage of the data that we've aggregated to, to, um, to do that. And this is a, available via services for other tools as well. So in summary, um, deep, deep phenotyping within and across species can aid diagnosis, discovery, and translational matchmaking. Um, of clinicians and basic scientists. Um, we desperately need this exchange standard uh, um, to facilitate distributed phenotype data sharing for patients and across species. And this computable evidence model, um, we hope, will, will bring um, better computational tractability to the, the diversity of functional evidence that we see in all the pathogenicity calls that are out there. And with an extremely large, very many thanks to all of our collaborators and data sources um, for which we would not exist. Um, and a special thanks also to uh, Chris Mungle, who's not here today, uh, for co-leading this initiative with Peter and I. So thanks very much. Uh, great. Um, Mark. So uh, two, 
quick questions. Uh, one is um, uh, the model for um, persistence and sustainability uh, of this extremely valuable resource. Uh, the second is that, um, you know, I think you've done an excellent job of showing how you can take all the different source data, uh, map it across uh, to ontologies into um, something that's tractable. Um, for us to make it to the bedside, of course, now there's another translation step, which is how do we get these resources to interact with laboratory information systems and uh, electronic health records. Uh, and so the question around that is, um, I know we've already got some um, connections between the ClinGen resource and, and Monarch. Uh, so is the strategy going forward to leverage ClinGen for that uh, step of the translation? Uh, or do you anticipate that um, working directly um, uh, with standards developers that are acceptable by EHR, either through uh, an API um, using Fire or perhaps um, um, just translating resources into uh, HL7 and, uh, and open info button are uh, approaches that more direct approaches would be better. So that's a, that's a really good question and we've been um, really just starting to take the first steps on how to approach that. The, the Examizer tool is used um, sort of more on the clinical research side for rare disease um, around the world. Um, so we have that working in those clinical settings, but that's of course a very small population. Our, our data right now is fundamentally best for that context. We, um, we have a, a, a new effort going on now to work more on um, cancer modeling and cancer phenotype data, but this, the system isn't really designed for that right now. So it's really focused mostly on Mendelian rarer diseases at the moment, but our idea is to now take these technologies and try them out on, on other more complex and common diseases. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is that um, we're, we're right now, we have a, um, a tool called Patient Archive, um, which is, is um, being used in a number of other countries, um, not so much here in the U.S. yet. Um, but it essentially tries to aggregate some of these functions into one platform and it performs text mining on the clinical notes um, and then spits you out a phenotype profile that the clinician can then vet um, and then see some of the analyses all in the same kind of platform. And it's very much a sort of brand new tool, but we'd love to have feedback and testers on, on that. And we're, um, we have a couple of universities here in the U.S. that are going to be um, testing some integration in the next year. Um, of some of that. Um, we've also been talking, uh, since we work a lot in the Global Alliance, and there's a, a new effort to coordinate some of the genomic APIs with the uh, FHIR standard there, um, trying to figure out where, it's essentially a triangle between the current genomic APIs, um, FHIR, and um, phenopackets, because the phenopackets um, phenotype part is the part that's been missing so far from, from both of those, really. So it, um, there's a new GA4GH working group to bring those three efforts together. Um, and then especially once that's been done, we can think about the smart apps, which is, I think, a great mechanism for um, implementing something like this. And we've met a couple times with the Epic folks as well, and they, they seem, you know, keen to do it, but it's not exactly clear where the road is. So I, I think would love uh, advice on that. So Mark wants a follow-up, and then we'll come over here. Right. So um, beware of uh, grabbiness from Epic. Uh, you may find everything disappearing into the maw. Uh, so see. Just, okay. just, just, you know, uh, uh, buyer beware there. Um, have you considered uh, working, uh, testing your phenotyping text miner with uh, eMERGE? Since uh, we are heavily invested in phenotyping, have certainly done some um, text mining, uh, but it seems like that would be a real natural um, uh, opportunity to test across a number of institutions that are really very familiar uh, with extracting phenotypes from electronic health record data. Yeah, a number of people have asked me that, and I, I hear there's a new rare disease effort in eMERGE, but I have yet to actually have those conversations. So um, we would be delighted to help um, with that effort. I think that the rare disease use case is very different than the eMERGE algorithms that they have now. You know, in looking at those algorithms myself before, they were pretty non-applicable to the kind of work that we were doing. But now that we're overlapping in this rare disease space, I think there's a lot of opportunities to work together and take advantage of their, you know, nice social network and um, process for, for doing that. So it's a, it's a great time to do that. This is really uh, great work. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, one of the potential issues is the subjectiveness of phenotyping information. Um, and so when you say increased keratosis, uh, or keratization, et cetera, what does increased mean? 
and can we move toward having some more quantitative things that's difficult to do in a clinic, in part because the technology that we use is um, not very high. I go to my clinic with a, a seamstress tape and a six inch plastic ruler, <laughs> um, which is not new tech, uh, and yeah. we have not really exploited uh, opportunities to um, to use new tech to both Im improve the, the, the quality of the information in terms of its quantitation, as well as to speed that process of phenotyping. Uh, individuals, so I'd, I'd encourage that as well. Thanks. So there's a lot of um, really important points in there. Um, you know, one comes back to the contextual data inter interrogation part. So, you know, if you know, one of the things I think is is especially true in the in the model organism community, but is also true clinically, is that everybody's experts in particular you know areas of phenotyping. And so, you know, if you're if you're looking at a, a patient or a zebrafish. You know, you might be an expert, an expert in you know craniofacial development, so you might not notice some cardiac defect, especially if they're subtle. But if you record then those specialized um, craniofacial defects, and the system says, hey, you know, we actually know from this mouse, a completely third organism, that those phenotypes commonly co-occur with this heart phenotype. Maybe you should look for this. That, you know, it's another way of, of, of sort of informing, you know, what we should be looking for so that we can be more effective phenotypers across all of the species. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, I think, um, you know, the quantitative piece. So um, the use of semantics is really a proxy for quantitative data, and we've actually taken um, the mouse phenome data database and worked closely with them to convert all of their quantitative data to qualitative semantic annotations. And the way that we do it is we just take a very, um, it's, it's a very brute force thing. We just say if anything that's plus or minus three standard deviations away from the mean of whatever population was evaluated, we count as abnormal or increased or decreased. And what we'd like to do is to be able to have the user specify where they want to draw those lines instead of us doing that. So right now it's just set up so that we kind of take a very, um, uh, uh, conservative approach in assigning abnormality, but it's better if the user does it. And, and, and then part of that also relates to the evidence and provenance piece because, of course, it's the reference populations and the reference definitions for the assay, especially for clinical labs where you have, you know, potentially um, uh, uh, different population values that need to be measured against, right? So you want to know which guidelines were used, what the date was, you know, and, and, and the population at which, you know, against which it was evaluated um, to then also. So I can imagine a system where you might have, you know, user-specified slider bars or something like that where you could tailor your system to, to take in, that into account. But it's important to recognize that this type of technology is a proxy for that data. It is not trying to operate um, natively on that quantitative data, but rather just lift out of those large numbers of quantitative data sources some of the um, bits of value that might be related across species to help send the user to the right place to go then look at the data. So Did I get all your questions? There's <laughs> like three of them in there. <laughs> so we're, we're running a bit behind. So um, Jose, Peter, and Callum all had questions, but I'm going to ask you guys to hold those for the discussion. Um, period, and so we'll move um, next to uh, Nancy.